So t today we have a little bit of a dynamic topic and one that's near and dear to my heart. We're working to place the industry that we work in in a new foundational space to move forward. We, we've been having a lot of conversations and a lot of policies about different parts of um, filmmaking being um, available to a new group of people. Um, what I wanted to do was have a little bit of perspective from everybody, uh, just to share a little bit of their thoughts on um, diverse storytelling and what that means to them. So if we can start at the far end, maybe Jen, if you'd like to, to share a little bit first. Oh gosh, okay, so thank you, Devin. Um, uh, so narrative sovereignty and diverse storytelling has been fundamental to the work I've done my whole career. Um, when I started out, it was very clear to me um, that black stories, for example, um, and diverse Canadian stories was not important to the Canadian broadcast system and the people who were green lighting. And in spite of that, I have made it my career goal to make these kinds of stories. Um, it's really interesting um, because there has been a shift in the landscape, uh, whereas before you would eke out like trying to get things made that was uh, with a diverse point of view, and it was sort of like you get a little pat on the head, like, oh, isn't that cute? How quaint! Um, and I think, um, <laughs> and I think, um, what's actually changed over in the, in the last five or six years has been indigenous communities have really expressed what narrative sovereignty is and has been a leader in um, defining that. And then the other piece is George Floyd and his murder. And I liken it to almost like Jesus Christ, so like before death and after death. And after death, there has been a, a greater interest in um, green lighting stories from the point of view of the people <laughs> who are making them, understanding that it matters who is bef behind the, ca the camera and before the camera. Um, like n not so long ago, Matt Damon um, famously said, diversity is in front of the camera. It didn't matter who was the creators, it didn't matter who was the writers, the directors, or the producers, and that is a fundamentally flawed point of view, but that is changing, and 40 Acres reflects that change. Uh, and it's a story about a black and indigenous family. Um, it it uh, harkens back to the notion that when enslaved people were uh, freed, originally they were intended to get 40 acres of land to belong to them. And so that story is a riff of that looking in a near future after a second civil war, <laughs> like that couldn't happen, um, <laughs> and, and what happens um, at that time. So I, you know, I, I can say that it's been um, a life uh, journey to to push for narrative sovereignty, um, but it certainly is um, a better time uh, where we are standing firm that we need to be a part of the stories that is about us and that there also storytelling has to expand to have more diversity in it. So that's, that's my POV on it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> Maybe we'll uh, get get Suzanne's perspective on the on the same question there, and uh, if you can share a little bit as well. On, uh well, I had a I had a uh, check check Rob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you know, just for fun, I almost walked in with some deer hide outfit and all my regalia, because you know, for se for a century, at least since the 19th century and 20th century we've been depicted and portrayed as, you know, a savage. You know, we've been stoic with Edward Curtis's, uh, you know, photographs. And he did those in the 19th and 20th century in terms of being stoic. We never smiled, <laughs> you know. This has been an ongoing narrative for indigenous people in the country in terms of having, you know, the correct and authentic portrayals of our people. When you look at some of cinematic, you know, releases over the years, right down to even The Doors. 
when Jim Morrison was having, you know, these visions of this medicine man coming around, you know. That was part of the portrayal and the depiction as well, was that the indigenous people were kind of magical. And there's medicine men, Aboriginal women, indigenous women also were depicted in a certain way as the, you know, the beautiful, you know, need to save the Indian woman. And I mean, there's names for us too. We were called squaws and what have you. But those have been the portrayals in cinema for, for many years. And we're not quite there yet. <laughs> I was a business agent when I went to Cannes France, mm, to MIPCOM, which is our course, our world stage for television and film. And I was there on behalf of several, uh, about five indigenous filmmakers. And you know what, we're there to learn. We're there to be educated, it's a huge trade show in France, and if you're a filmmaker, please do save your money and try and go, because it educates you, it opens your eyes in terms of what the world is buying and what our t stations are buying. But, you know, we're looking at the sell sheets, and we still see the portrayals on the sell sheets. You know, the eight and a half by 11 sell sheets that are there, that are saying, and very romantic in terms of how they see us and view us still in the world. So we have a lot of work to do. Still, uh, we have a, a numerous filmmakers that have, you know, have broken that ceiling and have been telling our story from documentaries to feature films to television series. We have amazing storytellers in our country that are indigenous. But we need more because we do have the dances with wolves that, uh, in terms of, you know, right? Beautiful film. Cinematically, it was beautiful. But me as an indigenous woman sitting there watching it, as much as I li like 90% of the film, there's still some inaccuracies there. And it was appalling to me that they, this woman, this character, behaved as though she was animal, unintelligent, what have you, that they adopt into the community. It still wasn't there. Still not there. We shot a film here in... Uh, in our community, a time machine, I can't remember what year, and then late 90s, Shania Twain. Everybody knows Shania Twain? Okay, so I was an extra at that time. <laughs> and Gordon Tatusis was present. So we're all standing there, we're at the sacred grounds where we do our socials, our big powwows, our ceremonies. Well, doesn't this beautiful lime green and yellow dart. It's, an, uh, it's an, uh, one of those retro cars from back in the 60s, 70s, early 70s. We're all looking at each other. And we're like uh, we're laughing. We laugh. We laugh a lot. Our people laugh a lot. We're laughers. We like to joke and tease. And we're all eyeballing each other. It's like, what's that? Where's the res dogs? Where's the res truck? We don't have shiny vehicles in our, in our community like that. We're poor. And it's like messy. And we got garbage a little bit here and there, but it wasn't authentic. And all of us indigenous people are sitting there as extras and watching the shoot that they were setting up for with the boom. We all laughed about it. It wasn't authentic. It wasn't our story, it wasn't our perspective, and it wasn't our truth. We have, oh, sorry, is that, a, is that good? Yeah? Uh, I, 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 I thought that was a great answer to that. Um, yeah, M M Micheline, I, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. I, I think you offer a unique perspective as, as you uh, have held quite a few different roles in, in the industry. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about um, what we as a community, like say Northern Ontario, can do to, uh, for filmmakers to support nar narrative sovereignty. I'm using the term narrative sovereignty to mean um, the ability to control your own depiction in media. So that, that I think is, is the goal for, uh, let's call it diversity or, or diverse perspectives, which is to be able to accurately portray or authentically portray your experience of life. 
Um, and, and I think that's something that get, has historically been taken, let's call it through colonialism or even uh, other ways, uh, economics or, or different factors that, that have done that. But um, yeah, so that, that, that's what we mean when we use that term for anyone who's not familiar. Um, I'm going to comment on it, <coughs> excuse me, from the casting perspective, because as you know, I've been involved in a lot of productions in Northern Ontario, and wearing my producing hat um, actually gives me a voice to, you know, to push a little bit more in terms of um, that diversity and inclusion that we're looking for. But on the casting side of things, I can't tell you how many productions that I have pushed uh, for them to... Uh, really look at the diverse landscape. So uh, I've got a handful of shows that I've done that we do require the diversity. And those are usually those family Christmas movies that you see every year. And the, the other side of it is the, um, the responsibility we have in our communities. So for example, um, just land acknowledgements when we start filming and having that on our call sheets. That's one area that we can really, you know, portray our communities, for one. Uh, two, when you're asked for casting options, I'm always keen to suggest, yes, the director is looking for a specific look, but I'm always keen to suggest some other options. Have a look at what talent is available to you. Um, because like Suzanne said, we're, we're portraying um, communities and for me I think it is super important to introduce producers coming into our communities to elders so that there is a consultation and a proper consultation on the cultural aspect of where you're filming um, you know we had we had an experience on a show I don't want to say names but you know there it was shot in a tick machine and you know, the community opened their arms to filming there, and they were briefed on the protocols of the community when it came to lunchtime, that the elders are to always eat first, then the children, then everybody else, and reminding them, guests in the community, and I, it was sort of sloughed off, you know, yeah, yeah, we heard you. I kept sending out reminders, and to my holy mortification on the day we were filming, didn't they leave the elders behind and everybody break for lunch? I cried because I respect the people in the community who gave us this opportunity. And then I went to the producers and I let them know how disappointed we were. I never got hired by them again. I didn't care because they, they broke a promise, a verbal promise to us that they were going to follow these protocols in the community. It was embarrassing. So, uh, and I don't want to paint all the negative pictures because there are productions that come through the community and are 1,000% respectful. They want to know about the city they're filming in. They want to know about the indigenous communities around them. And it, it's important for us to be those voices and to share um, who's available, what's around. You know, that, that consultation and with organizations like Scion, NOHFC, the city, people like Suzanne, I, Jennifer, I, it, it's just so very important to, to use your voice and not just be quiet. Another, one more quick experience, um, one of the screenings today, Aura, um, you know, Nigerian filmmaker, we have, a, we have a huge Nigerian community here in Sudbury. And <laughs> we also have a Nigerian um, food, catering, and uh, so for me as a company, I was casting on the show, I wanted the Nigerian community to also participate in this. Um, so we did a cultural, like, opening of the day. Let's sponsor a cultural meal. We're going to start the show off and have a Nigerian meal before we, we begin filming. And that's all I need to say. It's just, it's communication and working with each other. Thanks very much for that, Micheline. One of, the, one of the things that we're working on in Northern Ontario is building our industry. And building it right is one of the things that, you know, we talk about in meetings and have a lot of conversations about. And I, I know, Jen, on the administrative end of things, you're involved in a lot of high-level organizations. What, what are some things, or, or how can organizations like, like Cultural Industries Ontario North assist in the practice of on-screen equity? Like, like what, what can we be doing to help? 
Okay. Well, it's really interesting because um, in coming up here, I, I contacted Sion and, um, you know, uh, working uh, with Tamalola, my associate producer. It was really important for us, for example, to have diversity uh, with our team. And the, I think one of the problems sometimes, though, is that when you hire a specific person who agrees to diversity and agrees to some of the some of the things that you know, like let's say they agree to, this is we're going to honor the traditions of the community. Um, there is there is a system in place already that, as an outsider, we're just not aware of. So, for example, I asked Tamalola to reach out to some of the um, the com the indigenous communities to see if we could get um, indigenous. Uh, interns, um, th the names of indigenous crew members, and it was really, really difficult. So in my mind, I think that it would have been helpful to me if when I came up with Emily and Clayton, they were really wonderful, by the way, when I came up with them, if they had actually um, uh, had a dinner with some of the indigenous uh, community leaders and, and uh, key members in the industry so that we get that other picture too because we I, you know in sitting here um i I, I'm, I come here a little bit embarrassed because um um there's an incident that happened where we were advised to hire someone um but not having the full picture that there were options and what those options were um, from indigenous community, we made a decision. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to blame anyone because people just do what they're gonna do, but I do think one of the things that, that should happen is that when um, producers come up and are unfamiliar with the North, I think that more could be done to introduce us to the, the, the community, leaders in the community, from um, indigenous communities or other or Nigerian communities and so forth, um, you know, uh, so that we we really have a, when we're making decisions, we're making it with the best information, you know. Um, so I think I don't know if that answers the question, but I know that for myself, that is something that I would would want to do in coming up to the north to work with northern uh, teams, just to have. Not just saying, okay, well, there's, you know, the, there's this contact or whatever, but like, put something together, you know. I, I think that that's uh, that's definitely some work that we can take home with us. We handle the vendors list and and making sure that that's clear for incoming producers is something I think all of the communities of Northern Ontario w would get behind and we can do a better job of. Um, w one thing that I, I was hoping to follow up with that with is, um, you know, not to put you on the spot, but um, I, maybe there's a little bit of a um, context where hiring crew that is diverse is necessary. Maybe you can speak a little bit to why that is or why that would be a, of personal interest to you as a producer, um, just so that people have a context of that, because it's, it's not, you, you know, the, like it's not Toronto here. Like it's, yeah. it's a little bit different the way the community looks, and I think just to, to have that understanding, if you could share some thoughts on that. Well, so here's the thing, like diverse folks have had, even in Toronto, my whole career, getting in with the unions has been so difficult and continues to be difficult. So for me, any production that I do, I always say to my keys, I need to see a diverse team. And what actually usually happens is they, they say yes, and then they hire their friends. And then the unions, I mean, that's it, you know? <laughs> yeah, right? And then the unions themselves, they actually make it challenging because their number one priority is to get the union members working. And, those, and these are institutions that have been around for a very long time. And guess what? There was very little diversity to begin with. So, um, so for me, nothing actually changes Substantive changes does not happen when, like I said, you have diversity in front of the camera and behind the camera, right? Um, you know, I can tell you, as a producer, there have been a number of occasions where I've had what I call mini mutinies, where people look at me and they either try to dismiss my, my 
my value as a producer. They try to undermine um, and they try to take the power off the role. And they can do that when all their people are there. And when I have a diverse team, I cannot tell you how many times someone has pulled me aside and said, hey, this is what's happening. My very first production, my first, it happens all the time, still to this day, but my very first production, I was um, co-directing a documentary with my partner. And I had um, a, a team uh, and I had a PA because there were no black people who had this kind of skill. So I hired a PA. And um, so my partner and I, we drove in the one vehicle and the crew, it's a doc, so it was a camera person, a sound person, and the PA. And the PA drove them and the, and the gear. And the PA pulled us inside and said, those two, they're talking about you. They're saying, you guys don't deserve this. Why are they telling us what to do? We, the DOP, I've, you know, we've been shooting for five or six years before. These guys don't deserve that. And this is the stuff that they were saying. And, <laughs> and because of that PA coming to us, we were able to confront the situation and nip it in the bud to the point where the DOP broke down in tears, expressing that she was jealous over what I'd accomplished in pulling this thing together. And that was my very first production. And so it is tremendously important because it's hard for people to respond to someone that looks like me sometimes because they've never had that experience. And the work that we create tells them that I should work for them, right? And, it, and I, I'm not trying to, because you know, like I don't actually think everybody's this, these mean racist people, but it's like you're raised in a certain way of thinking, like a certain a hierarchy, a certain dynamic. And then here's this black woman rolling up saying, I don't like that, change it. And you're like, why do I, have, you know, so, you know, and I, I've had it even on this show where I said, you know, I've said, if I was Don Carmody, for example, a white male producer, no one would do a certain behavior. So, I mean, it's very long, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I just want to express that it is really crucial for us to have a diversity, to bring more diversity, to make space for diversity, and then we can actually all work together. I have a lot of respect, you know, for all people, my Canadian brothers and sisters, my indigenous brothers and sisters, Indi uh, Asian, whatever. Like, we all can work together. This does not have to belong to one side. It's time for us to let go of these old ways of thinking. It's not going to get us anywhere. In fact, we pretty much fuck the planet with this kind of thinking, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <Jen. laughs> so, on that note, I'll pass it on. <laughs> Maybe I'll jump ahead a little bit uh, <laughs> in some of the questions. Uh, that, was a, that was a great response, Jen. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Suzanne, I, I was thinking maybe uh, I'll ask you this question. Um, can you um, share some suggestions for filmmakers who wish to portray diverse communities that differ from their own? Wow, okay. That's, a, that like, that's super hot and tricky. <laughs> Just want to let everybody know that uh, even though we're I'm part of uh, uh, owning craft services for Northern Ontario here in terms of a craft provider for about ten years, I had a huge career prior to that in terms of producing. And I did co-productions with Australia. We did it on actually Indigenous policing, a feature film. Also been to MIPCOM. Did some editing for TVO. You know and worked for CTV for a number of years. And a lot of my work in those areas was portraying and changing that narrative and trying to destroy the stereotype that's out there in terms of indigenous people. Talking to the reporters, talking to the journalists, tell the good stories. It's not just about residential school. It's not just about this. But you know, people are lazy. They're lazy to do their research and really have a relationship with me and with our community that represents and should reflect authentically on the screen and behind the screen. 
and it's still not quite there. We're very romantic about that still. Even our own people are that way. And that has to be crushed. But we're in a time right now in terms of truth and reconciliation. Truth, truth. It's a relationship. It's about re a relationship, cleaning the slate. We get a chance to sit at the table now, and we have to engage. Part of that change in terms of transforming that piece is we also have to sit at the table and fight for it. Jen talked about, you know, our value, you know, as females, as women. Like, I have a triple jeopardy on me right now, too, and you would, too, <laughs> in terms of fighting to get our truth out and our voice to be heard. We took almost 10 years to become a member of IA, IATSE. We had to fight for that. I even had to call the president in New York and said, look it, we're the only crop provider. You're People are flying from Toronto, sanctioning all these craft servers. We're just trying to become a member so we're protected. We just want to be belong. We want to be part of the team. And, and, and we thought we had something to offer in terms of being from a Tigmishing First Nation, out of 634 First Nations in the country, and 42 in Ontario. We're pretty proud of it. <laughs> You know, that we saved enough money <laughs> to buy a craft truck. And provide amazing <laughs> craft service, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to plug in for that. Okay, so we do, we do serve boost meat and moose chili and Indian tacos and pickerel. And we do, because it's a piece of our treaty area. This is what we do. We live on that stuff. My son hunts for it every year. And he shot the last moose, and that's what we lived on. The guys, the grips, the electrics love the moose pepperettes. But you know what? You can't do that unless you have a relationship with them. That's where the narrative changes. We're n I'm not sitting in a teepee back home on the res. <laughs> like, I'm just not. <laughs> right? I don't have a feather here. I'm not wearing hide. You know, I'm pretty modern. Nish <laughs> nabe but a lot of people think so. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of ignorance out there. But that narrative has to change and it belongs to us. Our responsibility too, right? And the will of you know, who we're engaging with has to want this as well. Can I just comment on that? Um, I agree with you, Suzanne. There is a lot of ignorance, but there is an equal amount of support. And it's just finding the people who are supportive and collaborating. Um, and being, you know, in uh, just having the supporters, you know, because there, uh, there are a lot of uh, very supportive industry professionals. I mean, I'm sure you experienced even on Zombie Town every single morning our first AD read the land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And I wanna, I wanna share my experience going into their craft truck on the show where it was a space, a place of regeneration where you could, um, like f film and television is stressful and many other industries are stressful. The days are long, but when you go into a space where you can boost yourself, boost your battery, their truck was an experience for me where, oh my gosh, I needed a moment. And they created that space to do that with, you know, hydrating water and healthy. We lock them in, actually. They, they lock <laughs> us in. We do. We have a lock. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> you need a minute. Yeah, I do, actually. And they just will shut the door and give you that space. So it's pretty cool. So, so like, a, just to add to that, like, we smudge our truck, but it's very done very discreetly. And mind you, we got caught once. <laughs> Our director should not have been on set yet. <laughs> and he said, he's smelling, eh? He's like, what's that smell? <laughs> and of course, it smells sort of like marijuana a little bit, right? <laughs> so I, I, keep, I keep sage in our truck, and it sort of smells, it has that smell, right? Yeah. And it's like, so me and Cindy are eyeballing my daughter, who's the other co-owner, and we're like, 
uh, uh, we just finished smudging. He goes, well, what's that? I said, well, we just want to have a really good day and make sure that our hearts and our minds are clean and it's, it, we serve and take care of our cast and crew in a good way because I got to touch their food in that energy. So he really just listened. He says, well, would you mind, like, can I get a smudge? I said, yeah, absolutely. So we, we smudged him with our eagle feather and cleaned him so he had a good day on set with his team. You know, and, and there is good stories, right? There is good yeah. stories out there. Jones and yeah. Oh, just a um, couple of things. So our family, the story, 40 Acres, um, our director is Artie Thorne. He was up here earlier, uh, just a tremendous director and so proud to um, help him produce uh, his first feature. But we... Um, try to honor community uh, in our first day. We had um, Mary and Elder come to smudge uh, and uh, give prayer and do a land acknowledgement. And, um, and it was about 20 minutes. And, um, and you know, I did not, because you know, like every second counts. Yeah, I did, I did it, not, it yeah. <laughs> and it was, we had a giant circle uh, of the entire crew and it was just huge. And we did that. And then the second day we had a black um, minister, uh, a Nigerian, come to also do grace because again, the, I wanted the show to reflect the two cultures. But I wanted to answer something about um, what happens when you try to make something from a community that is not your own. So the script of 40 Acres, as I said, it's um, um, the family is black and indigenous. Michael Gray Eyes plays the father. Daniel Detweiler plays the mother. Um, and uh, it's actually mostly her and her son's story. That's the focus of the story. And so what we did, though, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it leans into um, the 40 Acres myth, uh, mytho mytho mythology, um, uh, looking at African Americans coming to Canada um, during um, the the um, the loyalist soldiers, so way back back in the day and generations later, um, but because we had the indigenous part of the family, we really wanted to make sure that um, um, whatever elements we had that that our writer. Uh, R.T. Thorne and, and Glenn, um, uh, the, the co-writer, whatever they'd written uh, that re w was reflective of indigenous culture was correct. So um, I have um, really good friends. Um, uh, Penny Gummerson is uh, as a writer, and Ryan uh, Cooper is another writer. And Penny was busy, but Ryan was able to, to um, uh, so I hired him as a consultant to go over the script, to, to work with RT, to make sure we had the right pieces. And then, um, uh, although Michael is indigenous, the, uh, the family is Cree, um, and Ryan is OG Cree, um, which is actually, as you know, different. Mm -hmm. so, so we actually hired a Cree uh, consultant to work with Michael to make sure that any Cree that was uttered was that had the right pronunciation and so forth. So for 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 me as a producer, I take it very seriously, um, you know, um, and um, uh, and that's you know, yeah. So that's yeah. So I think it's I think you have to do the work is what I'm I'm, I'm actually trying to say. Um, like I said, the story leans heavily into um, Black Canadian uh, st story um, focus. But because of the indigenous elements, we really wanted to uh, to get it right. And if this story was more on um, uh, the indigenous focus, I would have had an indigenous writer. I, I developed a series, didn't get greenlit, but it had an uh, a indigenous uh, young man in it. And so how I know Penny and Ryan is that even though we had one indigenous family, but because it was a series and it would be one of the central families, uh, I hired them in the writer's room 
right? Um, you know, to to help develop the series. So I take this stuff very, very seriously. You know, and if I'm doing a multi cultural where there's white families and black families and I always have white writers in the room. I feel like we can't just take for granted that we know each other's story. Mm -hmm. You know, so anyhow, so I think it's very important and we focus on it and we, we, we give it the the value that it's it's deserving. Awesome. I, I think that due diligence is just something that uh, it is so it is. great as a producer and to hear as a writer and, and just I, I think it's something like if you're not going to do that, maybe don't make your movie or show um, on, until you do. L like, it, there's really no room for you to freestyle what you think it might be. No. Can I just add to this? I was a cast uh, member, played uh, the stepmom to Indian Horse. And when we were shooting Indian Horse, <clears throat> as an indigenous person, we had non-Aboriginal, some uh, in terms of producers, right? And um, there's a lot. It was a really nice mix, but man, did they do a good job. We had cultural people that came even to craft. I wasn't allowed to go to craft anymore because I'm now cast, but <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I couldn't wait till craft came around. Like it was super funny, so I got, yeah. Anyway, so, but they came. They had our cultural people who we know, and they came and they, they made sure we were okay. Our spirit was okay because it was a tough movie. And we would go to set because we knew the scenes. Because my mother was also a residential school survivor. And I would have had an older brother if they didn't scoop him in the 60s. I don't know who he is. So some of those scenes for cast, native and non, were super hard. We would make cedar tea and bring it to the entire indigenous crew that was there and families that were present. But you know one thing, just so you know, because it does happen, just like Jen and her work and what she's doing, there are great producers and teams out there and I've experienced it and as an observer, as a participant, whatever, they would do a little ceremony with our camera unit every morning. And Steve Campanelli was our director, who's best buddies with Clint Eastwood, who was our executive producer, right? But they took it serious. They respected it and everything that had to be authenticated in that film, right down to the cutting of the braids. She, my mother had a letter that we kept that came from my great-grandmother that said, do not cut her braids. And she's allergic to wool. They cut his braids and it just devastated us. When we screened Indian Horse and it went to Cineplex, they had counselors, indigenous counselors and debrief counselors to help because my mom didn't know if she was gonna go. They're the ones, this is their story. When we talk about authentication, you know, is she gonna like this film? Like, is it gonna be real? Does she, like, is she gonna walk out? Like, I had all these, these anxieties about her experience with the film because of the subject area. And it was good healing for many of our people. She said it was really well done and she could feel it because that's what was told to her and they were able to depict that and capture that on camera so the audience can see the braid drop. And I remember just one more, I know I'm so sorry, 30 seconds. Our props dude is like literally scaling a table. Cut, because there was a scene and we had to pull an extra uh, from crew <laughs> to play one of the nuns that was gonna cut the hair. And there was an error and he saw it just before they, they said rolling and the cameras were going, he had to stop because he had the scissors in the wrong hand. The nuns never used the left hand because they used to beat my mom to change her, her left writing to right. Just little pieces like that. We felt super reassured that they were protecting 
our story too. And that was their truth, and we were able to complement that to bring it to the place where it needed to go. Th thank you so much for adding that to you. That's, that's brilliant. Um, one thing you touched on there that I thought was very interesting is the way that audiences um, learn from what they're seeing on screen or, or interact with that. Uh, uh, Micheline, I was hoping you could comment maybe on what are some of the conversations you hope audiences, after seeing a mo motion picture with a diverse perspective, what, what they'll take away from it if they're not part of that community? Representation on screen is one of the most powerful tools that we have in the industry and not just in multiculturalism, but also in um, now with the disability screen office, people seeing themselves on screen from any walk of life empowers individuals. And that's what I hope when people leave theaters, that they walk out and say, yes, we can do things differently. Um, we, we know the tragedy stories, there are so many of them, but there are also so many beautiful stories still to be told about the communities. The dance, the music, the food, the cultural aspect, the visual representations, the artwork, there are so many more stories to be told. So, yeah, what I hope people leave theaters with is you see the story, you feel the story. We need the tragedy, we need the triumph, we need both, we need the beefs and the bouquets in the representation of storytelling. That's what I hope for. Th thanks very much, Micheline. Um, I, I think what I'll do now is we'll open it up for a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if there's anyone that has a question, we, we can uh, take that now. Uh, great, great, thanks, R Ruby. Here Thank you, everybody, for this fantastic panel. Thank you, Devin. Um, so my question is about, I guess, the very early stages of producing, which is something that goes largely unseen in the industry. But a lot of these organizations that green light things, they're the ones that are you know, leading the charge in terms of wanting to include diverse storytellers. So when you're writing these grant applications, for me personally and the project I'm developing, I found it really challenging to stand in the truth of what my story is while also trying to capitalize on some of the funding that's available. So how, I, I guess my question is, how have you navigated being true to your story and not engaging in, I guess, like a trauma Olympics kind of energy? <laughs> Great word, trauma <laughs> That's my question. Yeah, go for it, Jen. Okay. Do it, do it. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, so as a black storyteller, I can tell you right now, if I wrote a, uh, um, a movie or a TV series about um, a young man who was a gangster, who is with a heart of gold, um, and trying to um, make his way through the projects, um, that it likely would get picked up because the truth is is that gatekeepers that have created these help to create what the world understand as these narratives they really haven't changed and really not a lot happens okay they'll do their best but they fall back on the tropes that they understand because it's just what they understand it to be. If you look behind every groundbreaking thing that's been done, there's been somebody from that community that's actually been able that 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 has actually helped to green light it or to to move it forwards. It's a really difficult thing to to change your fundamental understanding of narratives based on the narratives you've seen in the past. So I think for funding, okay, so this is what I, my, this is the actual, that was just spiel, but um, <laughs> this, is, this is the real answer. I think you have to figure out um, where you're seeking funding. So for example, the councils, the art councils and so forth, they're actually peppered mostly with artists 
and they are more inclined to give you um, an opportunity to tell the story that is personal, deeply personal to you. So I think if it's a deeply personal story, that's the place to go. And what I did in the early days when I started out was I met with the Arts Council people. I told them what I was trying to do, and I would get their input about what they thought I needed or what was missing and all those kinds of things. Um, because sometimes in a room, in a jury situation, there's two or three projects that one's gonna fall out. And, um, and because you made the time to sit down with the grant officer who's in the room, who doesn't get to make a decision, but might say, well, you know, I talked to her, and this is what she, th this is what she really means, or, you know, I really think that this person has um, the gravitas or the, 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 the you know, the um, skills to pull it off. And so what you have is a, an institution that's already focusing on your personal story. And I think in the councils, it is more about your personal stories. I think when you go into broadcast side, they're trying, they're doing better, um, but like, um, um, but the problem is, is that like mostly nothing's actually changed in terms of the people who are green lighting. Like it really, like all the people that was green lighting five years ago, um, maybe one or two have been let go and they maybe bought a couple of more here and there, but the people who are fundamentally saying yes, none of those people have changed. And so um, you have to, and, and this is the thing, you have, to f you have to have something that's enough of what they want and enough of what you want to get it over the transom. It can't be just about what you want. It's just not going to work in that in that landscape. I, I mean, I wish it, you know I could say it wasn't, but it, it it isn't. It's it has to be enough of what they want. So what you have to make sure it is enough of what you want and need, and that's that's what you're fighting for in that space, right? That it's enough of what you want and need, but understanding that they they want something, and they because they they're like. We know our audience. We know our people. Now, one of the la this is the last piece about this. Um, funding has changed to some extent. Um, indigenous communities have been very successful in getting um, s development funding and production funding, and so that means in 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 that community there is more funding available, and you're seeing the result, which is incredible work coming out of that community. Um, black communities um, and other POCs. It's, it's not quite, we, we really haven't gotten any independent funding. I mean, there's a thing called the PPRC, right? And you can get development funding from that, but you still need a broadcaster. Um, there's no real independent place that we could go that is specifically geared towards um, developing our material. Um, although Black Screen Office has a writing, um, has a, a story development um, funding, um, but there's not much else. So you're really still fighting that battle. And so what I, I think you have to really think about um, when you, if you're pitching to broadcasters, for example, what you've seen them do, what they're looking for and really understand it. You have to really understand it and then see if your thing is in alignment. Otherwise, I would go with the, the councils, which, by the way, there's quite a lot of money, especially if it's your first projects or so, first few projects and such. So that's, that's yeah, I, don't know, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th th <laughs> thanks very much, Jen. I just want to make a quick announcement to the room. If there's anyone who needs to catch the Aura screening, uh, we do have a film festival uh, happening at the same time as the panels. So ple on. please feel free to step out at this time. It's, uh, it's something we can accommodate. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll actually, Micheline was involved with that project and it is going to be popping out. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Micheline is heading out, but we are going to continue the panel oh, and have some questions. Um, so, so, so we're going to um, you know, continue having a conversation in the room and hopefully field some more questions and that kind of thing. So th thanks very much, everybody. Uh, so I'll pop out. I'll, I'll grab some questions. And Thank then, you. Uh, for remaining can I just, can uh, as yeah. a segue? Yeah, please do. Good. This is a cutthroat business, honey. It really is. I have a book at home that lists all the broadcasters around the world. We had to know who was buying what. Because there was certain countries even 
that would not buy anything with magic in it because they didn't believe in it. You have to understand the country, the broadcast in terms of what they're picking up because independent filmmakers are still struggling to get their films shown at Cineplex because all the big studios are buying up the seats. Yep. There's, a, there's a reality out there too. The, our, our funding uh, in terms of the Arts Council, I used to be a juror you know, for those stuff, I was appointed by the minister for Ontario Trillium for six years. And as a lead reviewer for projects that came to that table, because it was a $200 million envelope, it was a huge, huge, huge funding envelope. You're pitching projects like yours and yours and yours. And you do. You're right. You do need a champion. And I don't know if they're there all the time for us. And it's very subjective. It is. Because whatever is, is going on in terms of CRTC, in terms of what becomes Canadian content, one day is a little bit different than next. <laughs> right? Yeah. Jen, you would know this. And we would do this. We would talk to entertainment lawyers. We would say, okay, well, you know, what's going on here with Alanis? <laughs> you know, we'd have the best, we had the best professors at York teaching us about film. And the entertainment lawyers that would just call it out. The CSI franchise, we'd strategize, we'd figure it out. But when you're selling your idea and your project, those broadcasters, Especially for first first window, right? First yeah, window, absolutely. right? We only have a couple of national broadcasters in the country, period. And our audience is super small. What do we have? Thirty six million, roughly. Yeah. Who watch American television? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But when it comes to Canadian content, we still have maybe a Canadian actress in there, and all the themes are from the USA, and it's considered Canadian content, like. There's a lot of work that we have to still do out there, for sure. But it is a v it's, a, it's a lot of work, for sure. Don't walk in there naively with your pink glasses, because there is information you need to know. Is like, what are they buying? They, oh, you know, APTN buys this, CTV buys this, CBC buys this. Uh, th thanks very much for the answer, Suzanne. We're, we're going to take a question over here uh, from the audience. I just wanted to acknowledge Micheline, but she left already. She's one of the best casting directors in Northern Ontario, hands down. She's the kindest person. But anyway, Suzanne, thank you. I, I enjoyed meeting with you and showing me the brick, uh, representing your mother from the Spanish residential school. I've been there twice illegally, and I've taken a bunch of pictures. But this is to honor her mother, who was a, a child, a student of the Spanish res residential school. And Jennifer, I'm so glad you brought up what you did because I too pitched a product, uh, a story I wrote called Anaya. It was published twice. And it was about uh, a former slave and who came from the Underground Railway and ended up in Oro Medante, which is north of, of Barrie, where they were given really crappy farmland. And I had 3,000 words in my story, and then I had to cut it back to 1,500 for two publications. And then I pitched it to CBC, and they liked it, but they said that they only have a certain budget that they have to follow, and they, could, they were only limited to uh, maybe two movies for the year. And this was in 2014, 2015. So what you said really resonated. As, as the truth, like, and this is one of our supposedly Canadian that we pay for yeah. broadcasting companies <laughs> that, you know, they liked it, but they only have so much money. They said, but they didn't suggest what else they would be interested to publish or to promote or, or produce, sorry. But anyway, thank you, ladies, you all did a good job, including Michelin, who ran up the truth. Suzanne, are you, are you gonna share your story right now? Okay. Uh, yeah. This, let me just un let me just take it as a bundle for me. Okay, so we're talking about storytelling just as uh, my, for my closing remarks anyways in terms of storytelling. Thank you for bringing it up because I said I probably won't. I'm just going to let it. I said I would bring it up for you. You, you did. <laughs> if we didn't um, let you know what this was, you would have already had ideas in your mind. You had been guessing what on earth is this brick doing here and why is she bringing it in? 
But this is significant to us, to my family, to myself as the oldest daughter of a residential school survivor. I would take my mother every year, me and my daughter, for healing at the residential school. And this is a part of that building. But it wasn't until after the tribunal with the settlement, with the residential school settlement, um, when she had to sit down at the table of numerous lawyers with the Crown, and we had one little counselor, didn't know who she was, she was indigenous, we were super offended. But anyways, I, had to, I sat beside her, and we were touching, like our hips were touching on the chair, and we were told immediately that I, I am not to touch her, I am not to look at her, I am not to comfort her. And I like didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. Like I felt I, I, in my mind as there's, you know, I am resonating with that. It was like, you deprived my mother of love and affection in a school and you're gonna stop it here too when she needs to tell her story, her truth. She told her story and her truth, and from that day moving forward, uh, believe it or not, she felt a weight come off of her, and she felt free. So to her, that was the beginning of her healing journey, and we would take her every year, and she would point and tell us the banister that she would slide down, and because she was younger than my auntie, her sister, she would crawl under the table to get food from the great twos because they wouldn't feed the little ones. But there's other stories to be told. They d Canada, you don't know what happened with the settlement on in behind the scenes and how we had to get new lawyers because the first firm stole a hundred million dollars from us and from our survivors and a lawyer telling us, you just have to sign here just to prove that we will not take your money. There's so many stories to be told around this piece. I know it sounds, I just didn't want it to be <laughs> a closing point, but it was super important for me to bring this because it's been a story on the lips of Canadians and artists and filmmakers for a while now. But dig, because there's other stories and there's a piece of paper that we'd watch these people put a number beside. It was like one to 10, it was ranked. When my mother had to talk about sexual abuse, touching anything, there was a number associated to the level of pain that had a value for her, for them. And to me, how can you tell me that five, you're gonna give her $1,000 for that? That's a tr AI can never write. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, the story, like everything that you guys have talked about, like to me, today about like authenticity and diversity in front of the camera and but also it, it, within your crew and writing like I can't even believe that we're fighting for for that like because AI does not know the history and and they don't know what happened so I don't even know why it's a conversation and I, I'm sorry to bring it up because you know we don't want to talk about the strike but uh, you know if the world could hear what you all had to say today I think that they would be on our side and they would understand that this thing has to go away like ASAP right now. Awesome. Thank, Th thank you. you for that. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we have a question over here. Yeah um, my question was that so if Hypothetically, like if, if someone like me was working on a set that was really diverse, and since I'm white and male, I'm pr I have double the privilege, which, and so like what is something, or what are things that I could do to make it a better environment for the crew, so that everyone, so that it's a better, like safer space, it's a better space, more creative space, like what are things that others, people that are not of color, or that are male specifically actually too, mm -hmm. could do. Oh, I have lots of answers for that. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I really do. Okay, so one of the things is that sometimes jokes are made and 
even on my um, crew, there is a very powerful white male who is making jokes, misogynistic jokes, and um, and it it hurts people's feelings. It's you know I love hu I'm a very f I think I'm a, I'm hysterical. If you if you <laughs> if you hang out with me, you we would just like jokes all the time. But um, one of the things is to understand a part of your privilege is the, that when you when you when you are doing misogynistic jokes, when you're making jokes that actually might be funny, but but shrink other person someone else, like it's just it's not a joke. It, it, it seems that way to you, and people might laugh, but it's actually hurtful. So that's one of the things. The other thing is this, you know, and it's really basic and very simple. Just be present and see people. Like, you know, have the conversation with this other person and see them. Be there. Be present. And what actually just happens is that you, you are exchanging um, a, a conversation where you're seeing each other's humanity. You know, that's all. That's all we diverse people want is you to recognize my humanity as I recognize your humanity. You know? And just like having being real like oh gosh i love negronis um you know oh my god i'm wearing my cute boots today i don't know <laughs> like whatever the conversation you know just be there and be present and like i think everybody gets to have a voice this is what i'm this is this is the thing but just seeing the other person recognizing them and not um um, viewing them through these stereotypes, just like how you would like go into a room and you would ask someone, "Oh, what, 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 what are you doing? Or what's your job? Or how many kids do you have?" Like having those mundane conversations where you get to know someone, like you would do with like your cousin who is white or whatever. It's it's like I, I'm always so surprised that people think that it involves uh, uh, like some great effort or things or it doesn't it literally is just chilling and seeing people and being in the space with them and that's i think you do that and man it'll be like beautiful super easy <laughs>